So um, I had a little bit of a shuffle last minute uh, of talks. So I um, wanted to give a talk to you guys because I didn't see anything about um, an in-office laryngology procedures. I think this might have been touched a little bit on with Dr. Postman when he talked about dysphagia and T&E stuff. This will be a little bit of a crossover with that, um, looking at um, translated esophagoscopy, but also doing a lot of other in-office procedures and what all you can do in laryngology specifically uh, in the office. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's a little bit different right now uh, in this um, COVID environment, because uh, right now this these are definitely aerosol generating procedures and um, we're all trying to limit this a, a lot in our practices right now, just like we're doing uh, flexible laryngoscopy a whole lot less. Uh, so that is a big caveat before we get started. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, why the office? Um, so you might think, well, I have all our time. Uh, it's totally fine for me to go to the operating room, um, but patients can go about their day uh, physician time is better utilized. You don't have the uh, crossover uh, time uh, or sorry, changeover time in the OR where they have like 40 minutes or an hour uh, turnover time. Um, you can have rapid diagnosis. Like you can see somebody the first day that you can get the biopsy and um, start their treatment earlier. Um, a lot of patients prefer it. Um, and some people don't. Uh, some people's uh, noses might not tolerate it or they might just have a really, really strong gag reflex. They might not like it, but a lot of patients prefer it. Um, you avoid the general anesthesia risks, uh, which are a lot of the risks with procedures. Uh, no rigid instrumentation, so it's a lot less riskier, um, a lot less risky for doing procedures in terms of creating destruction or uh, creating problems. Uh, it's also far less expensive, uh, and with the better reimbursement codes of uh, 2017, it actually reimburses fairly well. Uh, why not in the office? Um, you, if you have a questionable airway, uh, or if you have unfavorable anatomy, um, I probably would not do this um, in the office. Uh, COVID and the aerosol generating uh, nature of this with uh, doing nebulized lidocaine and having you cough and, and uh, numbed up, um, you might not want to be doing this right now with the COVID environment. Uh, not appropriate is um, when you're looking for the post cricoid area, um, doing the exam there, uh, this doesn't ever really extend it open enough for you to be able to visualize that area uh, perfectly. Uh, and then also, obviously, if you have a poorly tolerant patient of a regular scope, you probably don't want to do an office procedure with them. Uh, other ways are just insurance won't pay or won't pay enough for your time. Uh, case in point is uh, some of these laser procedures with the coding that there is right now, um, sometimes they don't completely pay. Um, some carriers don't pay enough to cover your cost of the actual laser fiber. So then you're therefore losing money sometimes on doing these procedures. So you have to be aware of that uh, when you're setting this up in your practice, when you leave residency uh, and figuring out with your office manager uh, about whether you can actually do this and, uh, and not lose money for your department or office. Um, this is not new. This is actually quite fascinating. Uh, a lot of these, uh, I'll show a couple uh, pictures here of awake procedures where like, wow, I can't believe people used to do this. Um, but office laryngology was being done way before we started like trying, kind of bringing it back. Um, it was developed for operative techniques and, and general anesthesia. Um, um, the laryngoscope and the ability to see the uh, vocal folds was only really um, described in 1854. I mean, it's kind of a um, essentially a mirror examination in terms of the quality of images you get. So it's not by any means um, perfect in terms of what you're able to see, but it was at least a start. Um, this is just a weight um, patient where you're trying to look all the way down at the esophagus and you have this device that's pushing on a cricoid and I just can't imagine somebody going through this. It's like swallowing a sword. It's so much harder than what we have nowadays. Uh, these are 19th century instruments that you can see. I mean, they're curved perfectly to get down there um, into the oropharynx, into the esophagus, into the airway, and the vocal folds uh, to move foreign bodies, uh, to remove polyps, uh, to anesthetize. Um, just another picture, just rigid esophagoscopy of an awake patient. You don't see any ET tube right there. You have a patient that basically has their eyes covered over, but you're able to get down there pretty well. Uh, there, this is Manuel Garcia in the, in the bottom left. This is one of the most fascinating pictures. And this used to happen quite a bit uh, in the office for uh, surveillance procedures. 
uh, just to be able to visualize the esophagus and do rigid esophagoscopy on the weak patient. Uh, I think nowadays this um, would not really be done very much. Um, so influential factors that kind of what brought this back. Um, so distal chip tip endoscopes um, really brought the ability to see a lot of these lesions extremely well. Um, new injection materials that could be injected through a long needle, uh, fiber-based lasers that could go through a, a channel uh, endoscope. Uh, then you have innovative surgical techniques that just kind of um, brought the ability to do these awake procedures as opposed to and ways to get, a ga get around gag reflexes. Uh, you have the advantage of the office-based treatment that we already kind of go over, went over um, based off of um, patient preference and reducing your operative time. Uh, you had financial pressures trying to get um, other uh, procedures in the operating room, um, sometimes uh, of, of your own cases, uh, and also older, sicker patients that couldn't really tolerate general anesthesia. I mean, you had a lot of reasons as to why going back to the operating room. I think just with the advent of general anesthesia, a lot of this kind of was just so easy to do in the operating room. But now with uh, seeing so many of these patients that um, you might not be the best person to put to sleep or that you just can do in office, it, it opens up a whole new uh, avenue for you to intervene on them. So one of the procedures we're gonna talk about, um, TNE, translated esophagoscopy, uh, biopsies of lesions, uh, tracheoesophageal puncture, uh, secondary obviously, uh, dilation of structures, uh, an evaluation of uh, esophageal foreign bodies uh, or airway foreign bodies, airway evaluation, and also uh, within airway evaluation, uh, steroids in the uh, uh, subglottis. Uh, also, delivery of flexible lasers. You have all types of laryngeal injections, I mean, as anything you can kind of think of Botox, uh, steroids, off of your augment augmentation substances, whatever you think of. Uh, basically, the only thing I, I can't do is fat. I can't. Uh, uh, dilation of um, airway stenosis in some patients, in some centers, uh, definitely steroid injections. And uh, placement of pH probes and, and, um, and those uh, HRM procedures. So safety, um, this is very safe to do in the office. Uh, I mean, um, with 700 TNEs that were done back in like the early 2000s by my uh, former uh, fellowship director, Dr. Postma, out of 700 TNEs done, only two cases were aborted due to self basal vagal episode. I mean, it just basically the patient couldn't quite tolerate it for uh, just a couple minutes. I've had a couple of these uh, in my own practice. Um, and then a lot of times you're then still able to do it uh, once they kind of come out of it, um, and if they're willing to get, proceed. Uh, and then another one looking at 443 laser surgeries uh, only had one self limited epistaxis and one episode of self-limited laryngospasm, uh, which I've actually never seen a laryngospasm, even though we are constantly going past the vocal folds or hitting them with lasers or injecting them with needles. Um, it's actually fascinating to me that I haven't seen that yet, uh, luckily. Uh, I've had one person in my own practice that had an asthma exacerbation after I injected lidocaine. I think that is because she wasn't able to feel the breaths coming and I didn't realize how bad her asthma was. Um, but that was also self-limited. She was able to breathe through it. We gave her some steroids in the office and she was totally fine when she left. Um, and um, these are just all other uh, procedures looking at injection uh, procedures right when it was first starting to come out again, uh, no complications. Uh, uh, then looking at 20 unsedated um, balloon esophageal dilations, no complications out of 2009. Um, hemodynamic monitoring, I mean, a lot of times these are done in your office. A lot of times in a lot of practices, including mine, we don't in real time monitor their, their vitals. I mean, we are able to get their vitals when they first come in, if they're really, really hypertensive or have really um, bad um, vitals when they're first in the door, we're not gonna do a procedure on them that day. However, this was looking at how much uh, in real time um, their hemodynamics change. And um, oh, like, uh, unsurprisingly, the blood pressure and the heart rate in a lot of these patients do go up. So if you have a person with uh, unstable angina or somebody that's like that, this might not be the best thing, best place to do this procedure on them. Uh, take them to the operating room where you can do in real time monitoring of their vitals to make sure you're not going to uh, put their heart at risk or uh, put them at a stroke risk or something like that. Um, I don't think I go over it anywhere else, but um, for um, anticoagulation, antithrombotic status, you don't have to 
uh, take them off their anticoagulants for these procedures. And you're just taxing the scope essentially and just doing a quick needle or doing a laser procedure. I don't take people off antithrombotic or Plavix, of aspirin, of Coumadin, of Eliquis, any of these. I don't take them off of it when I'm doing a flexible in-office procedure like this. Um, and we've shown good data that shows that it doesn't change their outcomes or uh, puts them at bleeding risk for it. So that's another thing I don't think I mentioned in the slide out this. Um, so, I mean, in kind of conclusion from that office-based surgery, a burrow digestive tract, and, and digestive tract has been safe and well tolerated and uh, further avoids the risk of general anesthesia. And there are a lot of risks from general anesthesia. I mean, they can put this, this monitor anywhere they want to. They can kind of give the surgeon all types of aerosol um, uh, anesthetic to, to the surgeon to make them all types of sleepy. Uh, some of the uh, residents here at our institution and other institution might recognize this doctor here. Um, but again, the, no sedation is done in the office. Uh, None of us in ENT that I'm aware of are credentialed, unlike our OMFS colleagues, to do sedation in the office. Um, so therefore, because you don't have any sedation, it's quicker, uh, significantly less risk because you don't have that anesthetic involved. You don't have to have that airway risk of them not breathing on their own. Uh, it's less expensive because they don't have that sedation. Um, and patients like it because they don't have that haze after the anesthetic uh, to where they can literally just go right back to work if they want to, or go back to taking care of their loved one or drive themselves home and not have to come in with somebody else uh, as their driver. So for the anesthesia for these procedures, it's all about the nose. So topically numbing the nose, uh, topically numbing the back of the pharynx uh, to be able to get in there. Um, really it's minimal pharyngeal stimulation, especially look, uh, talking about uh, translangiosophagoscopy. So we don't actually even numb the pharynx, we, sh we just do the nose or uh, translates esophagoscopy. When you are doing an uh, injection procedure, doing a bronx, or going anything past the vocal folds or touching the vocal folds, then that's when you need to do nebulized lidocaine and then followed by topical lidocaine via the working channel or some type of other drip device back in the back of the pharynx. And um, before I get too far into this, just let me know if you guys have any questions um, or, um, or want me to stop at any part of this if something doesn't make sense. So, um, so this is just a, a picture of what you can see doing change of esophagoscopy. You can see there's tons of um, white plaque down here or fungus or uh, cancers, anything all around the whole length of the esophagus. So uh, history of esophagoscopy, this is just one of these sword swallowers I'm just fascinated by. Um, so 1806 was when somebody first visualized the proximal esophagus and it took about a hundred years before people were actually Esophagoscope uh, with the Jackson, and then uh, with Chevalier Jackson, and then um, in the 1950s when heterotopic gastric epithelium with Barrett's esophagus was first kind of described, and then the first flexible fiber optic endoscope was developed in 1957. Uh, the first teeny was actually developed by um, Razor Shaker, uh, who's a GI up in Wisconsin. Um, and um, thinking that it would kind of go more into the GI realm, but then it kind of switched back in the ENT realm where it had been kind of from the get-go. So what is a TNE? A TNE is essentially uh, short for translates esophagoscope. It's a 4.2 to 5.1 millimeter outside diameter distal chip camera. It's not something you can look through. It's something you have to cook up to the tower. It's six, most of them are 60 centimeters long. They used to make a 120 long variety, but uh, it was just so hard to handle, uh, especially for the endophilus. So 60 centimeters is able to get you into the stomach on virtually everyone. Uh, might not, no, not let you retroflex on some of the um, uh, taller individuals you see in the office, but almost everyone. Um, it allows unsedated exam of the upper edges of the tract. So it doesn't typically let you go uh, too far into the um, like past the stomach uh, or looking all throughout the stomach, but it lets you see all of the esophagus. Uh, provides air circulation, uh, suction capability, as well as biopsy or whatever you want to do through the working channel. So this is kind of what this looks like, uh, what a um, EGD looks like, and going down to the smaller uh, TNE variety that's on the far right. Uh, this is a outer sheath uh, that you can put onto some of these scopes. Um, to be able to kind of um, be another way that you can 
reprocess them so you don't have to then technically reprocess them or have another working channel with your in, within your endoscope. You can just have this outer sheath that has that working channel, has a suction capability, has the um, insufflation and water um, delivery methods through it. But I haven't seen one of these in a while and I don't use this. I use uh, just the one we can use to reprocess. Uh, why the office uh, for the teeny? It is just almost a second, the same diagnostic accuracy of, of the EGD. It has a lot of safety um, in that you don't have a lot of bleeding risk from it. Uh, and it's not as large. You can get it in uh, much easier than the, than the EGD scope. Uh, patients prefer it in some studies, uh, in most of the studies when we look at that. Uh, and also cost is a lot less. You don't have to pay for the whole operating room. You don't have to pay for the procedure and all the stuff we've already talked about. Uh, why not the office? Um, lack of knowledge about what you're looking at, lack of experience. Um, like, what if I miss something in the office? Um, yeah, like, by doing this teeny. Uh, patient concerns uh, about doing an awake procedure. Uh, GI conflict. I mean, this is not to be understated too much. I mean, if you have a relationship with the GIs and they don't want you to be doing this or they want to be doing all of it, you do have to kind of work with them to uh, make sure that they know that you are taking care of your patients, um, that uh, if you see something, you will give them. Um, this and it won't be taken away from their practice. Uh, I don't, I've worked really well with GIs in the past as well as here at University of Kentucky. Um, and the, they do pretty well in terms of interacting with, with me. I, I, I feel like I've developed a really great relationship with GI. Um, post cricoid exposure is one of those areas that you're not able to, gonna, you're not able to see very well in the office with the team. It's not able to open up that area as well to visualize if you're curious about cancer, if you're curious about a really bad stricture right there. Um, and obviously you can't intervene as aggressively, I think, in the office as you can uh, in the OR. Uh, why an unsedated exam? Uh, I mean, cardiopulmonary related events, I mean, there's a lot um, during uh, endoscopy procedures in the OR. Uh, I mean, it has, um, during the survey of this, I mean, a lot of people had seen mortalities even from uh, endoscopy events in the main, o in the OR or in the uh, sedation suites. Uh, why the unsedated exam? I mean, I mean, you have a lot of loss of work time by patients. You have the additional person that has to transport them home. You have that recovery team, you have the sedation team, you have all these other teams that are involved with, the take, with taking care of the uh, sedated procedure. Uh, looking at them head to head, um, there's really no significant difference involving the diagnosis um, of Barrett's esophagus or dysplasia uh, between TNE and the esophagoscopy. And in the study, about 70% actually preferred the TNE. Um, there has been one complication within the use of TNE, and that was one case of esophageal perforation. Uh, I believe that was in a Zinker's um, pouch, uh, and it was not done in America. I think it was done over in Europe. Time ago, um, but only one that, that all of us are really aware of. Um, and we use this quite often. Uh, two large patient series, um, one about 1,100 patients from France and one about 700 in the United States, um, only had epistaxis and vasovagal episode is really the highest uh, risk of, of complications from it. And those are self-limited. Um, and really no major teeny complications reported except for those that are already mentioned. NPO is not required. Um, you want to have them on a, on a uh, uh, like if you're having them come in in the morning, you want to have them just have like a coffee, uh, really nothing much more than that in the morning. If they're coming in for the afternoon, then just have like a little bit of something for breakfast. Uh, so you don't have too much stuff in the stomach. So they don't have too much um, uh, possible nausea when you're distending their stomach with the insufflation a little bit. And you also want to be mindful that you don't insufflate so much for an awake patient nearly as much as you do in the OR because they will feel that. They will feel a little bit of nausea um, when you're actually doing the procedure. It's markedly less expensive as well. Uh, same sensitivity and specificity. Really the only com the difference is that the biopsy forceps and the teeny do not go quite as deep. Uh, so if you do have a dysplasia or something like that, then it might be beneficial to then take them to do an EGD or uh, a procedure in the operating room. Um, so so when do you do the, just the EGD? It's really if the patient, uh, or, or also just send them to the GI, um, it's if the patient has abdominal pain, if they have nausea, if they have early satiety, 
uh, or history of gastric or duodenal ulcers. This, um, a t &E, uh, with a length of 60 centimeters and with doing it in the office or even in the office area, you're not going to be able to visualize all the stuff that's going to lead to problems with these problems, with uh, abdominal pain, nausea, early satiety, or the history of gastric duodenal ulcers. That's really what I, um, if they tell me that, then I typically then involve my GI colleagues to then have them evaluate the patient with an EGD. They can go further. They can uh, evaluate the um, proximal small intestine and all these other things that can lead to those problems. Uh, those are typically not going to be found in the esophagus, and I'm not going to really do them a service by just screening the esophagus and not doing further. So I really um, um, don't like to do two procedures when they, the patient only really has to do one. Um, and again, reflux and dysphagia are very common. Um, a lot of people have GERD, a lot of people have extraesophageal reflux or LPR, um, and there's a lot, some studies out there that say Barrett's esophagus uh, is more found in people that have uh, symptoms of LPR as opposed to even um, GERD symptoms. So, I mean, um, some of the people that we see in our office with LPR um, should be the ones that we should be actually looking at more often in terms of doing esophagoscopy. Uh, and also dysphagia is very, very common. About 10% of adults over 50 will have some type of claim of dysphagia. And about 75% of dysphagic adults without neurodisease have esophageal etiology for their dysphagia. Uh, again, not for uh, post-stroke, um, but um, and also reflux is just very common outside of this dysphagia. So a lot of your patients that are going to be seeing you in the office will probably have some need at some point of getting some type of screen of their esophagus for their dysphagia or reflux symptoms if they have them. Um, some concepts just to kind of go over while we're wrapping up t &E, uh, is referred sensation from the esophagus. About a third of the patients that have lower esophageal sphincter pathology will feel it above the clavicles. So just because somebody feels like they have something right here, doesn't mean that they don't have something further down. So you might be missing something if you just do a uh, flexible laryngoscopy on them in the office and say, oh, you're just totally fine. Uh, if they haven't had some type of esophagoscopy to look down there in quite some time or at all. And then you have visceral hypersensitivity. I mean, the vagus nerve um, that we kind of blame for a lot of issues with globus and cough uh, and all types of other things in the throat. Um, you can have a pathology at the lower esophageal sphincter or in the lower esophagus and have it referred up again here to the back of the throat. Uh, it's where you have this kind of vagus crossover stuff information uh, where it doesn't quite know how to deal with that information. So it feels it as a globus or as a, a something that makes a cough, but it's really coming from the esophagus. So you gotta always kind of be a little bit wary of that when you're looking at, at somebody with dysphagia or cough that you're not overlooking the esophagus. Um, and some other things, just you can use it as a screening exam for reflux or dysphagia or globus. Um, I would caution you on using it for all LPR patients, but somebody who's not responding to treatments, somebody who you can't quite get a handle on in terms of what their problem is. Um, screening and follow-up exams for head and neck cancer patients. Uh, this is one of those things that's not completely delineated exactly when we need to do this, um, but these patients that have head and neck cancers are still at risk for esophageal primaries. Uh, and um, I feel like they will at some point be also at risk for esophageal cancers, especially our people that have a history of smoking and drinking. Um, they are also going to be just the same amount of uh, problems with uh, esophageal cancers. And also with the uh, lack of uh, saliva that they're generated after head and neck radiation, they're going to have less saliva that buffers the lower esophagus from reflux. So if they have any amount of reflux, then it might be more susceptible to having adenocarcinoma on the back uh, further uh, after treatments. So all these things to consider. Um, you can do all types of biopsies of lesions in the pharynx, the esophagus, the larynx, the proximal trachea, basically anywhere you can stick the scope. Uh, and also evaluation of the esophageal foreign body. Uh, some other procedures you can do with it. You can do dilation of strictures. Uh, if you have uh, basically using a Jaguar catheter, uh, you can place the, um, the teeny down and um, be able, sorry, place the teeny down, put the Jaguar through it, pick the teeny out, and then um, put the balloon over, it has to be a wire guided balloon, put it over the uh, Jaguar, and then the teeny follows it. And then you're looking basically like a flexible laryngoscopy to the back of the back of the of the hypopharynx, and then you blow up the balloon while you're visualizing the airway to make sure they're still able to breathe, and then making sure that it's in the post area and uh, dilating. 
if you're dilating further down, probably not best to do it in the uh, office. And also uh, in some centers, as well as my own, we don't typically do dilation of strictures in the office because uh, there's a fair amount of them that don't really tolerate it. It's quite a lot of pressure and pain when they're uh, dealing with that uh, balloon. Um, and some people just can't tolerate that at all. Um, so this is just a picture of Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is, it, you can visualize it by doing, um, uh, well, just by looking at it, but you really have to do a biopsy to truly get a diagnosis of Barrett's esophagus. And you have to have goblet cells that are inside of the biopsy specimen of the esophageal, uh, of the esophageal biopsy. Just another picture of Barrett's esophagus. Other things you can see when you're doing a teeny is Barrett's, um, um, like I talked about, but candidiasis, uh, fungal infections, very common actually in, in patients who already have dysphagia and they're not swollen as much. Uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, this is very common, especially in kids and adults who have uh, food impaction problems. Um, it's most common or the most common reason why people will have that. Uh, you can find a diverticula, not just the zincers, but also just esophageal diverticula. Uh, traction diverticulum further down, uh, and you also find, find hiatal hernias. So, um, in general, the TNE is um, what you can use after you've done a flexible laryngoscopy. You just numb up their nose a little bit because the scope is just a little bit larger, about uh, 0.8 millimeters to one millimeter larger. Um, you, so, you topicalize their nose about 10 minutes. You don't do anything to their back of their throat. You pass the TNE scope through the larger side of their nostrils. Then you just um, have them just sit back in their chair for a good five minutes while you're doing it. Um, you go to the post cricoid area, then you have them swallow, and then you just pass it like you would a typical NG tube or a gobble tube. And then you go down fairly quickly down in the stomach. You try to retroflex back there, and then you try to take a look as you're coming back to look at the lower esophageal sphincter area, look for see if they have a hiatal hernia or a Barrett's esophagus, you take biopsies. They don't feel the biopsies so much when you're taking it. It's really when you get prox more proximally that they actually do feel it somewhat. Um, so you've gotta be mindful of how close you are up to the top of the proximal esophagus, um, but they're able to tolerate it just fine once you're in there. Uh, and then once you're done, uh, you're done. You can send the patient home on their way. Again, no problems if um, they're on Coumadin or Plyvex for any of these. Uh, let's just talk about the head and neck um, cancer follow-ups. High rates of esophageal pathology after radiation. So uh, again, ideal timing is not quite known uh, for TNE about when we should uh, be looking at that or our outcomes of actually taking a look. So switching gears here a little bit for upper airway stuff. So this is, if you're doing upper airway evaluation past just flexible laryngoscopy, you then need to start talking about doing some topical lighting. Um, this you can use to evaluate the larynx, the trachea, even the bronchi, um, or even secondary bronchi. Um, you can do it upright, uh, which I mean, I think most ENTs will do in the office. Uh, you can do it supine like the pulmonologists do, but uh, most of us, I feel like, do it upright. It's pretty dynamic, so if you have anybody with tracheal malacia, it's perfect to do the awake uh, because then you can actually see what uh, uh, amount of problem from their airway is actually coming from their dynamic tracheal malacia collapse. Um, it's great to do prior to de decannulation or a failed decannulation or following airway surgery for if you're following for subglottic stenosis or tracheal stenosis. I've got a video here. Let's see if this plays as well. So this is from my last days in fellowship. Uh, this person has already been numbed up. you can see you're going to go past the vocal cords. Again, you cannot go past the vocal cords until you numb them. So this person got some nebulized lidocaine as well as some drip 4% lidocaine back in the back of the uh, vocal folds by having, say, E or coughing. So there you can see just how bad this tracheal stenosis is before you take them to the operating room. And that's very important to, to know how bad this airway is before you uh, really get, because um, this person was a new person to the clinic, we didn't know how bad they'd be. Um, it's very important to know how bad your airway is going to be so you develop a good enough plan to deal with them. So if you can't see the airway stenosis, but they have a really bad strider, I think it's great to do a bronch on them in the office, um, numb them up to where you know if you can tube them. 
you know uh, where the stenosis is. So if you do have to do a trach, you can kind of know exactly kind of where to put it. Um, all these inf things to know about before you're in the heat of surgery and don't have the really backup plans for yourself. Uh, just while we're here and switching gears, right here is kind of the area where if you're doing um, steroids in the subglottic uh, stenosis, or in this case, tracheal stenosis, uh, if you're going through the cricothyroid membrane, you'd see the needle kind of going in through here. And then if you're already numbed up, you can just um, switch up the needle, which I typically use a 25 gauge needle. And you just see it here in floating in the airway. And then you can inject into the various areas areas of the stenosis. If it's, if it's a little further down like the tracheal stenosis, you can go a little bit further down than the cricothyroid membrane, uh, even below the cricoid if you really need to get to that stenosis because I don't think it could go in this patient. Um, but that's something we're doing more often. Uh, after a study by Franco uh, up in Boston, uh, where he found that injecting steroids in the office to idiopathic subglottic stenosis patients improved 13 of his patients, roughly equivalent to the OR dilation with steroids. Um, so that's something that a lot of centers, including mine, were starting to do uh, more steroids, uh, both pre as well as post um, intervention in the, in the OR to help kind of maximize what we're doing. Uh, and also for these autoimmune or idiopathic subglottic stenosis, getting pretty good results in trying to prevent them from coming to back to the operating room, uh, which I think that's definitely one of those things that's fairly easy to do in the office because it's not that much more than just doing a flexible laryngoscopy exam on them. Um, so one, of, one other uh, great thing about doing this in the office is you can do, um, in doing it on the tower, is that you can do a recorded exam and go slow motion uh, on seeing what it actually looks like. Um, so some of these patients that you're not really able and don't want to do bronchoscopy on, you can still do a recorded exam on them with these distal chip scopes and just get a quick half second view of their tracheal stenosis or their subglottic stenosis uh, to at least get a feel for what it is before you take them to the OR or before you do um, the num numbing uh, lidocaine before you do the actual procedure. Uh, just so you know how bad of stenosis they are or if you even want to do a steroid injection or another procedure. Um, if you're able to freeze frame everything. Um, you can't palpate the arytenoid very well. So if you're curious about the uh, vocal fold, the arytenoid ability to uh, move or if it's fixated versus paralyzed, it's not best to do this in the, in the um, office. You probably need to go to the operating room. So switching gears a little bit, you can also do a secondary TEP. Um, the, if, and this is also done if the primary TEP is not done by the surgeon at the time or if it's like a, a salvage laryngectomy and they didn't want to do it at the time because there's a flap in that way. Um, and also if the patient is not able to do self to speech or not able to do um, the uh, electrolarynx, which a lot of patients don't really prefer those methods, uh, or if they have just prosthesis dislodgement and they need to have something else done there. Um, in a good study out of um, about 13 tough TEPs that were OR had a 100% success rate in the study done by my um, former fellowship director, Dr. Boshman. Um, the, um, so, I mean, it's fairly easily done. We'll help show a little video here in a second. Um, it's great also for patients with significant medical issues that you don't want to take them to the OR, or if they just have really bad uh, anatomy in the first place to bring them there, uh, or maybe they just don't have any neck extension whatsoever. It's perfect. Uh, also, there's some questions about whether you can have improved sizing. So um, with doing a secondary TEP and doing this in the office, um, there's some data that you have less prosthesis length change uh, because you have less edema of that common wall when you're actually doing the procedure itself as you're just doing it basically that cell linear thing. So this is kind of the uh, PLA introducer set that we use. I mean, it's essentially what uh, you use from the I'm doing a solving your like central line. Let's see this video will play. So you've numbed up there, um, the area where you see the, um, where you'd like to have the TEP, where it's easy for the um, uh, speech pathologist to visualize it. You're then passing this guide wire uh, while having the TME in there and maybe having a little bit of insufflation. And then you, um, Take out that needle. Then you're able to dilate that area. 
And all this you're doing under direct visualization. And this is that peel away set. And typically, I like passing a red rubber catheter during this and not actually placing the actual um, prosthesis just to let the area just kind of settle down so you know exactly what prosthesis they need to have when they come back in in a week or two. So this is a red rubber catheter going in. That'll then be sutured to the neck. And this is that peel away part where it just peels away all the way up to the neck. And then you just have the red rubber in there. And you can see it's right there where you want to have a TEP that's uh, easily accessible by the speech language pathologist, whoever's dealing with it. So uh, pretty safe and simple. Um, it's uh, very effective, but very well tolerated by patients. Um, it mean, once you numb up that skin right there, there's not that many uh, areas where the patient's uh, uh, not able to handle it. Obviously, you have to have a, a nose that's able to tolerate the T and E scope to go down, uh, but uh, that's pretty much always the case. It's far less expensive than going to the operating room as well. Uh, so switching gears a little bit to vocal injections. So this is done a lot of ways. Uh, you can go trans thyroid, you can go cricothyroid, which that uh, image right there is a little bit off because a lot of times we go uh, from the uh, midline. Um, and then thyrohyoid approach, uh, and also peroral technique. Uh, not all patients will tolerate peroral technique, um, but the advantage is it's very versatile and uh, precise and it's kind of min it kind of mimics uh, what you see in the operating room. So I feel like it's, it's pretty easy to uh, master once you get it. Uh, thyroid, thyroid highlight approach is um, through a transcerebral injection through the uh, thyroid space right above the thyroid notch right here. Um, you can visualize the needle in the airway um, and it basically comes out right at the petiole of the upper bodice and it's very well tolerated. Uh, this is by one of my residency mentors, Dr. Amin. And I think this is a nice video from the NYU Voice Center where you're palpating that thyroid notch numbing a little bit. You're just going right underneath the skin. You don't have to go very deep with this numbing. At first. And he's advancing it further in. Aspirating before he's injecting. And then you can see on the inside. You can see those pooled secretions, so you can tell the patient's already been um, had some nebulized lidocaine and had a little bit of spray of lidocaine inside. That's typical of 4% lidocaine. 2% is typically not strong enough. For this approach, you do have to have a longer needle, so you have to have at least an inch and a half long, uh, 25 gauge needle. And you can see it just right there from the patio of the abodice. This is the approach to just topically numbing those vocal folds even more. Palpating again. Even more secretions because the patient's even been more topically numbed. This is, I believe, prolarian gel that he's injecting right here. So you're able to change the angle and go into the actual vocal fold. And you can see it plump up in real time. Like a 
hypothyroid approach, you'd be seeing the needle from below the vocal folds, and you'd have to kind of see it coming up from um, behind. So you might have a little bit of hemorrhage from that. Not too uncommon. Um, now I'm switching to lasers. So um, in-office laser indications, I mean, if you have um, RRP, if you have chronic granuloma, if you have some recurrent leukoplakia, where you've already had a biopsy specimen, you actually know what it is, as well as cancer palliation. If you know it's a cancer and the patient just cannot go to the operating room, I've uh, got uh, at least one patient that's like that. Um, and just you're trying to get some type of airway control and some type of voice control. Uh, also, polypoid generation, like, Rinky's edema. If you have hemorrhagic polyps, uh, it's perfect for this because the uh, ATB laser actually has affinity for that red color, so it's going to eat it up perfectly. And then some cases of airway stenosis even. Um, so in office laser equipment you're going to need, you're going to need a, a t &E or some type of other channeled uh, flexible scope, a, a laser with a fiber optic delivery system, which not all of it does. Uh, used to be PDL, uh, now KTB is one of the most common making that. So there's a blue laser that's out there now. Also CO2 has a wave, um, or Omni guide. CO2 has the channel in it, but doesn't have any um, um, guiding uh, um, any beam to know exactly where it's going to go. You have to have proper eye protection in room for everyone, and it's wavelength specific, so it's going to be different for KTP versus CO2. Uh, and second scope uh, may be used for retraction if you need something to kind of move up, or some type of, some other thing to move a vocal flow. I've never really used that one before. Um, but technique, again, safety is paramount in this. You have to have the room uh, with enough uh, notification on the outside to tell people, like, go and come in. There's lasers being used. You have to have eye protection for everyone in the room, including the patient, anyone that's there with them. Uh, you have to have the standard teeny anesthesia uh, like on the nose, but then you also have to do topical lidocaine on the vocal folds or wherever you're actually working uh, in order to get them not to really react too much when you're doing the laser energy. Uh, there. Um, we don't really ever have to do uh, spirulins or nerve blocks. Uh, it's typically just a little bit too much anesthesia for these patients to do. Um, and also the the back, like post glycoid area or the supraglottis is a little bit harder to, to topically numb than the actual vocal folds for some reason. Um, and you must see the laser fiber tip when you're firing or else you might fire on the inside of your scope and damage your scope. Um, patient has to be NPO, not leading up to procedure, but afterwards because they've been topically numb. Uh, anytime you're topically numbing these patients, it's going to last for about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So I always tell my patients to wait an hour and a half before they're eating or drinking anything after a procedure like this when I'm topically numbing them. Uh, these are just pictures of uh, Rinky's edema. Um, you can see this is prior to any intervention. This is right after you've had it blanched by, um, I believe this is either PDL or KTB laser, and this is a few weeks afterwards, and this is after both sides have been treated. You guys can see my cursor? Hopefully that's a yes. So this is just a granuloma posterior glottic granuloma that you can get in there with the KTP laser and just um, go inside of it. There is a non-contact technique as well as contact technique. Contact is going to be more um, more destructive. Uh, but then once you have that blanched quality, um, then typically you know that that tissue is going to not survive and going to die off. Let's see if there's any other lasering in there. And this is just a little bit of steroid injection afterwards. So once you already have them numbed up, there's no reason why you can't also inject steroids in there. This is a per oral technique of doing the steroids. I'll go back to where that needle is being inserted. Typically just kind of go up to where you're seeing a little bit of the palate and a little bit of the base of the tongue. Um, and this needs two people to be able to do this. You need to have either an assistant holding the scope or you need to um, um, just have two people, one person holding a scope and one person doing the injection. And this is very similar to the peripheral technique for injecting uh, vocal augmentation. This is just steroids uh, that could be injected into that uh, granuloma. And then done. 
Uh, this is just kind of a picture from an guy's website talking about uh, flexible CO2. Again, this is kind of off-putting because you don't see the guiding beam of where you're actually hitting, unlike the KTP laser that we just had. So you're kind of just kind of taking a blowtorch down there and not really sure where the end point is. So if you're kind of touching the tissue, you're very close to it, or there's not that much stuff behind it that you're concerned about hitting, uh, this is a great way to deal with, in this case, some papilloma that's inside the trachea. And CO2 is um, a little more destructive, so you don't see that blanching quality nearly as much. Um, if you defocus the CO2 laser, which is kind of hard to do with the OmniGuide, uh, but you can get that same blanched quality like in the operating room, but it's very difficult to uh, defocus the OmniGuide. You can do airway stenosis or any type of uh, thing further down. I believe this is in the secondary bronchial um, that um, just kind of lasering this piece of tissue that's down there that's uh, kind of blocking off the airway. Uh, cost comparison, RRP in the OR versus in-clinic laser. I think a um, good study by Weiss, um, it's about $5,000 less expense per case doing this in the office. Um, again, like I said, the very first, you have to be uh, mindful of how much you're being reimbursed for these procedures in terms of how much you're actually going to get um, in um, um, compensation for the laser fiber. Because laser fiber, just like the injectables you're going to be injecting, for vocal bowl injections, those are going to be the main source for costs. Um, only limitation for in office biopsies, uh, which in office biopsies are not that much different from what we already kind of went over in terms of the actual procedure, but um, only limitation is that a negative biopsy cannot be the definitive compared to OR biopsy. So if you get a cancer, then great. Uh, it's great specificity, so it's not going to be uh, diagnosing a false positive uh, for a, a cancer. But if you get a, a negative um, or cannot rule out cancer on the in-office biopsy, you still need to take them to the operating room to get a biopsy. But it's a great way to kind of fast track them into getting treatments earlier if, if the biopsy is successful. So in-office tips, uh, work the nose. Uh, the nasal discomfort is really the thing that's going to limit you in almost all these cases. Um, don't numb the larynx too much. Um, especially with the elderly, they can aspirate and start coughing and also auto peeping, like in terms of closing their vocal folds off when they're exhaling. And it kind of makes it very difficult to uh, follow that vocal fold if you're trying to like, uh, inject it or to uh, hit it with a laser. Uh, and sometimes you do can over numb them. Uh, you can still cause webs and um, problems with uh, vocal fold scar if you're too aggressive, uh, especially with lasers um, in terms of hitting the anterocomager. Uh, or other areas. So keep that to be mindful. Uh, always talk to the patient. Uh, I'm constantly talking to the patient uh, and telling them what we're doing, or what's coming up, uh, or, what, or, or what I'm doing. Uh, always check the patient position too. Like if you have them completely laying flat on the um, back of the chair um, and they're just completely uh, running away from you, just like if you're doing a flexible endoscopy, you're not going to get a great image. You're not going to get a great um, uh, vocal fold get a great laser if they're in that position. If they're doing a teeny, they can just be laying back and just completely uh, content just laying back on with their head on the back of the chair. Um, I typically have family in the room. Some patients, family members don't like to be in the room, but I like to have them there to have buy-in that what we're doing is what we're doing and this is how we're doing it. Um, so uh, I always have them in the room, but they have, also have to have the laser specific safety glasses if we're doing lasers. Um, the fibers can also go through curved suctions if you're, um, if say, if you can't do um, put the larger TNE scope through the um, uh, through the nose, you can just have a regular laryngoscope scope that's through the uh, nose and then pass the laser fiber through the the same like needle injector just without the needle and then do it that way. I've also found that I don't need a TNE or a channel scope when I'm doing uh, a bronch or when I'm doing a uh, uh, subglottic steroid injection because there's not as many secretions down there to suction up. Um, so I typically just use a regular scope, and I didn't mention that earlier. I typically just use a regular scope for that because it's a little bit more patient comfort when we're just using that scope in the office. So last slide here. Um, in summary, I mean, it's a safer, more effective uh, procedure for some patients and for some um, type of procedures. It's well tolerated by patients. Um, it's far less expensive. It's also a growing part of practices, especially in laryngology and a lot of other areas. So, um, 
um, with that, I'll take some questions. Got one up here. Mark, thank you for your talk. Um, I've asked some panelists before, what got you interested in laryngology in the first place? Uh, a lot of things. They, they had the coolest toys. Uh, I mean, a lot of these things that we kind of went over, um, I mean, lasers and uh, scopes and all these different things, they're quite fascinating. Um, it's very functional in terms of airway, um, voice and, um, swallowing like it's very functional in terms of like everyone's doing that at all times of the day if you don't have that then it's making a huge impact on your life and then um those are a lot of the big reasons and also my mentors my mentors were great people like in general just and they were laryngologists um so it really kind of brought me to the field very good Appreciate you talking again this morning. Um, and just for people out there listening, we're um, coming up next. We'll have Dr. Ahmad uh, from Cooper University Hospital uh, talking about some uh, malignant tumors of the paranasal sinuses. And um, we now on the YouTube videos have 7,000 hits on the dot as of today, uh, particularly for the residents who are listening from institutions. If, if a faculty member from your institution has not lectured on the consortium yet, um, try to get them involved if possible. Um, we have uh, about 34, 35 uh, institutions that are involved now. We know that residents from the Philippines and Kenya are now listening to us, um, among others. And so just everybody, appreciate everybody coming together. So thanks again, Mark. Um, see you around. You we'll get going here in about another eight minutes. Um, Dr. Ahmad's on.